one of the things you learn when you've had a hit show is that it's harder to maintain a successful show than to create one. The first year was all so fast and exciting, and then the second, you know, you started to get the feeling like, well, we might, we might have something here. As we went into that year, there were a lot of question marks about what is the show going to be? Are we going to be able to maintain the elevated status of the show that we'd had in that first year? Was the quality going to be the same? What characterizes season two for me, probably above and beyond storylines, were the cast changes that were happening. David Caruso's exit, Jimmy Smith's entrance, Justine Michelli came in, Kim Delaney. Caution was in the air that you know, here we had this wonderful machine, and gee, we hope it doesn't break. It couldn't have been a more chaotic uh, period, pretty much across the board. Johnny, I did what I did, and I'm ready to go away for it. That's not right. If you were not a cop, this would not be happening. A DA would let you plead. But I wouldn't be able to live with myself if it brings you down, too. Trials and Tribulations, that's uh, the first episode of the second season. Where, uh, it might as well have been called The Gathering Storm. Hey! Ah! David Caruso's involvement in the crafting of his exit from the series was zero. Uh, we didn't consult him. We didn't feel it was any of his concern. He was the one who wanted out. We were accommodating him. Uh, we certainly didn't want to be vindictive towards the character. So we worked very hard, albeit quickly, to figure out a credible exit for the character. We weren't going to kill him off or anything like that. I, I don't think the audience would have been too thrilled with us. What we wanted to do was find a way to get him out of the series organically. And, and by virtue of the stories that we had told in the first season. Detective Kelly, is it your testimony that you felt no curiosity as to why Miss Lekowski had been approached? Did you think she'd been approached at random? I thought she was approached because her father was in their pocket until he killed himself. Cops have an expression called testa lying. Uh, which is, it's, it, it's understood that when a cop gets on the stand, he's going to lie. I need those 12 people back, believing she made a free confession. That's the truth. The truth and a trial have as much to do with each other as a hot dog and a warm puppy. I'm asking, can you sell the story? Yeah. Here we go. If Kelly was going to be thrown off the job, I wanted to find a way that he would lose his right to, to function as a cop by telling a lie which was in the service of a greater truth. You keep thinking you told your last lie. Your you quandaries I don't get. Anyways, maybe you're done now. Season two for Andy and Sylvia, what we find is Sipowitz sort of crawling back to Sylvia because he has put himself back in the AA, or I guess for the first time, the AA program, which he works religiously and has a sponsor played by Peter Boyle, who is so wonderful in it. You and I are going to have a contract. Any slackening in your program, any losing focus, I'm going to step in. Are we clear on that? We're clear. As long as we have that contract, you can ask her out and you see his struggles with that process of becoming sober and staying sober and acknowledging that he is an alcoholic every day, whether it's making amends or following the rules about not having a, a relationship for the first year of sobriety and his very tender, earnest conversations with Sylvia about his desires. For whom the scale rolls had two big stories in it. Uh, the first was the conclusion of the LaCalce trial. Amy Brenneman was so great as LaCalce, and, and we, in the first season, had done this storyline where she winds up killing a gangster, uh, murdering a gangster. So we really had put ourselves into a box with that, and, and I remember we, we called Amy in to sit her down, and 
tell her yeah. that we were going to wind up losing this character because <laughs> we actually sort of had no choice. How say you as to the first count of murder in the second degree? Guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. How say you to the second count of manslaughter in the first degree? Guilty. And the other big story was the planting of the seeds for David Caruso's departure. Uh, IAB started to look into he and Sipowitz's uh, approach to some cases. John, when they were done on the bus, they got onto you and Lacalzi. Marino Ledger. Stuff like, uh, if it's Metavoice case, how come you held the ledger? Got me in their crosshairs. In For Whom the Skell Rolls, um, we see Andy and Sylvia trying to find their way back to to being able to see each other again and see if there's a potential for a, uh, a reconciliation of, of the relationship. I'm proud of your self-control. Well, I'm gonna get there. Like, uh, I, got, I got my work here, you know, and uh, I got my, my problem, which I'm making progress on, and you. He gets carried away at one point, and out of the blue, where, while they're having a dinner, a lovely dinner, just says to her, why don't we get married? Which is sweet and endearing in a way, and disappointing also, because it doesn't really feel like a proposal. It feels like a spur of the moment suggestion, like, hey, why don't we drive up to Connecticut this weekend? He didn't know how to go about doing it, so he just kind of uh, threw it in as part of the conversation, <laughs> and that's the only way he could get it off his chest. Don't say nothing now. I'm just thinking out loud. It's okay. <clears throat> Cop Suey was my first episode. Very exciting time for me. My wife was a former detective and my partner in the police department. So ever since we've been really working the show, we've always tried to develop a strong female detective character in the show. And in the second season, we brought on Justine Michelli to play this Lesniak character. I was very nervous. I was a new kid on the block. And um, I just wanted to do well. <laughs> and um, I kept pinching myself because I couldn't believe I was actually there. And I was working with these great actors. Detective Martinez, Adrian Lesniak, I'm your relief. Welcome aboard. Justine had this wonderful quality and was just a, totally believable as a, as a cop, as a detective. And um, she was real New York, the real thing. Where are you going? I'm going to pick up the husband unless you got a problem with that. No, I don't have a problem with that. And do me a favor, Detective Lesniak. Don't you worry where I'm going. Just worry about what you got to do. Are you getting my drift? Yes, I get your drift. Sipowitz just had it out for me. I still, to this day, I can't figure out why. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to go question this guy, even if it's just to rule him out. Meanwhile, I would appreciate it if you would take your attitude and shove it up your ass. The boys invited me for the first and only time out for a beer. And after that little episode with the Bruzo, I was never asked back. You think this is over for you? Huh? It's not. You still love me. Be right Get back. your hands off me. I'm not letting you go. Wait a minute. Guys. Guys. Everything okay? She's okay. Yeah. I think you need to take off, Jimmy. Yeah, I think you should go hump yourself, John. What out, John? I don't need anybody protecting me, all right? My problems are my problems. Dead and Gone was David Caruso's last episode. I don't think it's any great secret that David Crusoe is a little difficult to work with. Him leaving and Jimmy coming on was, we were looking forward to as something that would make life easier. You transferred to Borough Dispatch Duty, John. Steady day tour. Effective tomorrow. For me, I loved working with everyone, so I was very excited, you know, to be there and to be a part of everything. So I enjoyed working with David. I was sad to see him leave. I thought I was going to be 65 when I left this job. Kick it and scream for that age waiver. Thanks, buddy. Back at you. 
it's just a very sad, hard, tough thing to swallow. And that was Andy Sipwitz on the inside. Dennis on the inside is thinking, well, here we go. Here we're going we're gonna to start this thing again. We have been so lucky and we're wonderful we're getting into this thing. And now what? Now the, now the ship is starting to sail in a different direction. And the last shot was a crane shot where David walks out the front door. And so there were some complicated moves that were involved with this crane shot, which sort of pulled up from the, from the floor to this sort of high angle tableau of Caruso taking a look back at the 15th precinct before he walked out the door. He kept walking, he walked out the door, around the side of the stage, got in a waiting limo and drove off. Nobody knew, you know, until they were ready to do another take and he was gone. He felt that they had, you know, had seen enough gotten what they needed, and uh, since that was his last shot, he was going to quit on his own terms. You know, every time you take one character out and put another character in, it completely changes the dynamics of everybody's relationships. Jimmy's first day was, uh, you know, there was a lot of anticipation in terms of like, okay, let's see what the new guys got. Morning. Let's go. Andy Sipwitz. Oh, Andy, Bobby Simone, good to meet you. Yeah. There was no way on earth anybody was going to replace John Kelly as my partner. Uh, and then, of course, this, this new man comes on, this Bobby Simone. And he was a great partner immediately. Anybody can recognize this is a good man and a good cop. But my mind is shut, and I'm not going to accept anybody. And all of a sudden, there he was. <laughs> and, you know, he walked into the squad, and... It was, it was a new guy. He was every bit the cop that John Kelly was, you know. And, uh, but, you know, a different feel. He was a Latino brother joining, you know. I figured maybe we'd be able to get something going chemistry-wise between the two of us on this show. It was as if somebody opened up all the windows. Jimmy was so elegant, you know, personally. He, he, he walked into that situation. He was so friendly prepared, accessible to people. Good morning, Andy. It's no good. It's not going to work out. What is it? I, I just met this new guy. Um, Simone? Yeah, that's not going to work out. What happened? Oh, don't get me started. I mean, uh, his attitude's all wrong. How you doing this type of thing? He asked you how you were doing? Yeah. And we watch uh, uh, Sipwitz do cartwheels, handstands, half gainers, and... Uh, every other gymnastic technique to avoid uh, getting to know him or believing that he can function with him professionally. That was the first time where we really got a sense of how Sipwitz didn't like change. And so he sort of embodied the audience's point of view in terms of their unsure whether this was going to work. Look, Andy, you worked a long time with your last partner. Me and you... We're not always going to start on the same page. Yeah. I hope you're not the sensitive type. Sensitive? No, not usually. As Andy Sipwitz got comfortable, we as an audience got comfortable, and we were able to send the message that, you know what, this is a good guy, and he's going to be okay. So by the end of the episode, um, he has won me over, and uh, we end where there's a, a, a very quiet bonding and acceptance uh, between the two characters, uh, Bobby Simone and Andy Sipwitz. This is some... Uh... Greek stuff from those Greek places. Uh, you know, those great belief roles. Dolma. Sylvia stopped for it. The ADA you met. Thanks. Yeah, that's her idea. At the end of the first year, we started to domesticate Sipowitz in his relationship with Sharon Lawrence. And one of the things that I remember David Milch talking about was that he, he wanted to make sure that, that the domestication of Sipowitz, of this wild animal, was not going to make him a boring character. In the final adjustment, um, we have what's known as the shower scene. We spent a good episode and a half getting Simone up on his feet 
let's do a little something here for Sipowitz. And so Stephen said, I think it's time for the shower scene. Neither one of them had had their sort of turn in the naked sweepstakes on our show. It's for when you come out of your shower. Yeah, I guess maybe I better take one. There were other nude scenes in NYPD Blue, but this was the only one that has been given the title the shower scene, and for good reason. Um, yes, it does take place in a shower, and uh, it is the first time that the, the world saw Dennis Franz's derriere. We sort of did that as a joke to the audience and sort of a wink of the eye, because up to that point, everybody who came on the show was bearing their asses. And uh, we had people passing us on the street and yelling, yo, Sip, what's when we're going to see your ass? And, of course, for obvious reasons, they were sparing the audience of that. So they decided, okay, you know what, let's, let's give it to them. What are you doing? I thought it'd be fun if we both took a shower. Two for the price of one. It was a very funny, charming scene, though. It, 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 it allowed NYPD Blue to do what it was known for, which brought adult content to, to hour-long primetime television. But this one in particular had a lot of humor um, and a lot of tenderness and awkwardness. So it's not your typical love scene. Whoa, whoa, hey, hey, uh, I usually wash myself down there. Do you want me to stop? Uh, no, not necessarily. Boy, that's sure gonna be clean. This uh, episode is called Double Abandando, and this is the episode that my sister is introduced into the series. I guess the season start, started out uh, normally enough in terms of, uh, you know, uh, Donna and I were sort of into, into a normal uh, relationship where we kind of settled in and, and we were living in the same apartment or whatever. Uh, but it was, it was kind of dull, I guess. Yeah. And then her sister showed up. She split with the husband. I'm sorry to hear that. And whenever she has a crisis, I'm supposed to bail her out. It's not like we got a lot of room at our place. Wait, you, you, your sister's coming to stay? The woman that they had hired to play my sister was Deborah Messing from Will and Grace. Anyway, in this episode, um, she, uh, she's kind of a troublemaker. By the way, this is my sister Dana, Detective Metaboy. Hi, at last we meet. Dana. Uh, look, looks like you just got into town, huh? Just. Well, uh, enjoy your stay. Dana also has a habit of, uh, of um, stealing uh, Donna's boyfriends. So there's a little bit of a history here. And uh, I had a wonderful time doing the episode. Could you hold me just for a second? Oh, Dana, I, I don't think that's such a good idea. Just hold me for a second, please. Yeah, all right, J just, just for a second. There you go. Oh, here's Donna now. Donna, I'm, I'm glad you're here. Dana, Dana's very upset about her future. Oh, yeah? Is that why her robe's open? When her sister moves in to her apartment, you really see another side of, of Donna. You recognize that she can be ferocious, that she's not just a, um, a sweet, delicate flower, but she's, she really does... Um, set the boundaries with her sister. I, I, I think you got the wrong impression. Here. Greg was offering support, which is more than I could say for you the last few days. Yeah? He was offering support. And what were you offering? Girls, ladies. This is how she thinks. She can't conceive of a man and woman bonding without some sexual aspect. Uh, excuse me, I, I'm going for a walk. Gordon Clapp being sandwiched between uh, Deborah Messing and Gail O'Grady. How lucky I thought he was, you know? I was like, why did it happen to him and not me? What the hell happened? We'll get to that. How are you doing? I'm all right, Dan. Yeah? Have you gotten another sponsor? No. 
Have you gone back out? No, I haven't. Let's talk about me at another time. I want to know how you got beat up. Well, you, uh, you met my son Danny, didn't you, about four months ago? We were very fortunate to have, um, as a guest actor, uh, Peter Boyle on uh, one of the episodes, You Bet Your Life. And uh, he's having very strong difficulties with his son, played by uh, another great actor, Enrico Colantoni, who is uh, on uh, Just Shoot Me. And he's, he's a, a great actor, and he played a wonderfully off-centered character. You're gonna have to go someplace with me, Danny. We'll Why? Uh, rules and regulations, I gotta talk. I eat by myself. Well, we'll just go over and have a boat. Danny, hey. During that same episode, there was also um, the beginning of the, uh, the partnership of um, Martinez and uh, Metavoy. We're cut off. Uh, but Steve disconnected the wire. We got no confession from this guy, Weldon James. Metavoy Martinez started to become a relationship that, you know, uh, we really didn't get that much into in the first season, a little bit towards the end of the first season, but in the second season, we started to really build on that relationship. Don We Now Our Gay Apparel had two big stories in it. Uh, the first was uh, where Sipwitz and Simone uh, investigated a murder at a gay bar. One of the fun things that we would do in NYPD Blue was take Sipwitz and put him into uncomfortable situations and, and see how he reacted to it, and uh, this definitely did that. Hey, Andy, you uh, see that blonde chick that found the body? Yeah. Yeah, she's a sex change. Yeah? Yeah. She does lounge act here. No. Yeah. The uncle's coming in. Uh, he said to clean out the safe. All right, I'll get back to you. Okay. Here's the first one at the body. The former male. The writers, the, the producers, the directors have always had fun, and I have fun, putting Andy in awkward positions. And I think that's when he's, you know, he's, he, he's most interesting, uh, when things are not comfortable with him. What makes sense to me now is, is to be with him, to look after him. I can't agree with you on this. I made my choice. He's my son. I have to look after him. The second big story in here was another Sipowitz story where his AA sponsor, Dan Breen, who was played by Peter Boyle, ends up getting murdered. If he comes after you, you get out of there, Dan. I was a cop a long time. I can take care of myself. It has quite an impact on, uh, on me, and uh, it's just, and, and on the audience, it was a really a heart-wrenching performance by, by both those actors. I think Peter and, and Enrico did wonderful jobs in that, and it was, it was really one of the outstanding uh, episodes, I think, of, of all of them that we've done. I heard my dad. I talked to Andy Jr. before about maybe having dinner tomorrow night. Uh, you wanna have him over? Well, uh, I, I kinda thought I'd kinda gradually let him know about our situation, but well, maybe it's a, a good idea he gets a whole picture. And in the butt, Bob, you find that Andy and Sylvia have settled into a version of life that um, is more comfortable, more stable. There's, um, I think, a trust that he really is seriously on the, the right road to recovery uh, for his alcohol addiction. She has faith in that, she trusts him. I remember the uh, second proposal that is being made between uh, Andy and Sylvia, and it was handled, again, awkwardly, but a lot more um, seriously. Ask me again, Andy. What do you mean? Ask me again. Will you marry me, Sylvia? But the seriousness of the occasion was really kind of lovable and laughable because there Sylvia was with her uh, rubber gloves on, and uh, she had been doing the dishes. So I'm embracing her, and Sylvia's rubbing her rubber gloves together, and I thought that was really an awkward uh, uh, niceness to that particular moment. I don't have any further comment to you. Excuse Bobby. me. Bobby. 
I want to buy you dinner. Do you do that sort of thing yet? Yeah, I do that sort of thing. Good. That's also the episode where they were starting to explore the relationship of uh, Bobby Simone and a Benita character the, played by Melinda Canacarides. They put Simone through a series of women, which, why wouldn't you? You wouldn't want to hook him up too fast. That would be a waste. And I remember Melina Canacarides was on the show playing a, a journalist, and uh, I really liked her work, I, and, and I liked her personally so much. And uh, obviously, audiences really do react to her because she went on and, and starred in her own series, Providence. Benita, I've always liked you. I just assume I feel like you're working me. If you think all I'm doing here is working a story, then you're not as good a detective as everyone says. So, what's your routine? Me? I don't really have one. I just want to get this thing done with. Vishivashi Vinny is in episode where Simone finds a way to nail Webster, the dictionary killer. I think we're in touch on this here, George. You wanted me to find that gun. That's why you mentioned how hot it was last summer. You knew I'd look at that air conditioner in your place, wonder why it wasn't working. You knew I'd find that gun there. Also in this episode, uh, Lieutenant Fancy is being pressured to leave the department by Commander Haverhill, and he finds a way to turn the tables on him. Listen to this. I'm on Fancy on tape, buying into a story. You admit to him is bogus. No, the armored car heist is real. I'm talking about this Pachenko nonsense. You get Fancy to sign on, and I'm going to use it to get him out. All right, if that's what you want. It's a careful nigga, but you made a career out of lying, so I am confident you'll come up with the right details. I remember that episode because that's where I was going to go toe to toe with the character of Haverhill, um, at, played by actor James Handy, who I had worked with you know, on previous shows, and I really liked the dynamic that was created between the two of us. You dirty son of a bitch. Now, there's an easy way and there's a hard way. What the hell is that supposed to mean? That tape's either a preamble to your retirement speech downstairs, or it's my attorney's opening argument at your civil trial. So James Handy shows up on the set, and I said, James, man, James, you know, it was great. I was asking where you were, you know, and, you know, they should bring you back. And he said, oh, I really appreciate that. I really appreciate it. And I said, well, there's good news and, and there's bad news. The good news is we, we get to act again, you know, and, and why, you know? The bad news is after I'm through with you, you ain't never going to work on this show again. <laughs> I'll take retirement. I got no love for what this job's turned into. When you put the power pack here, it activates the box, and when you wear it over your head for two hours a day, you will see a marked improvement in your appearance. Miss Machersky, how much did you pay for this box? I paid $2,000 for that box. Largemouth bass. Martinez and Lesniak are investigating about these production of black boxes to make homely women look attractive. It was so sad. I mean, it was really pathetic. I mean, these women were actually buying into it. I don't understand how people fall for this stuff. Yeah, people want to feel better about themselves. Hey, I want to be three inches taller, but I ain't going to stick my head in an empty box. <laughs> this was typical Lesniak because as much as she wanted to help, she just sometimes would want to shake you up just so that you'd be aware of what you're doing. You sleep with these women? As seldom as possible. Unfortunately, I had to do a couple this week. An unhappy, unloved woman is the most desperate thing in the world, especially if she's a beast. <laughs> but if it gets that bad, you can always turn her face down, you know what I mean? I'll sign that complaint. What, uh, what kind of money yes. are we talking about? So will I. The largemouth bass is, uh, has uh, one of my all-time favorite scenes in it. Hey, you changed my station? Put it back. Sipwitz would only listen to oldies, and when Simone would want to listen to a different radio station, to Sipwitz that was inexplicable. So Simone typically adjusted to Sipwitz, and he put on the oldie station, and then the Duke of Earl came on. Duke of Earl. 
But I'm gonna get a company man here now. It's a great tune. Seven. You seem very cheery today. We'll walk, oh yeah? Through my Maybe you just got laid. For Sipwitz, that's big that the other guy even knows that, you know, and so Sipwitz <clears throat> started to hum it himself, you know, but he didn't want the other guy to hear. And finally they began to harmonize. Excuse me, Doctor. Yeah. I'm Detective Martinez. This is Detective hey. Lesniak. Paul. Adrian. Hey. <laughs> oh. Wow. You two know each other? Yeah, we were friends in high school. You, uh, you don't look any different. You look great. Thanks. Travels with Andy. Yes, this is where I have the potential of a wonderful flame. Tom Verica. Now, Tom and I are friends, so I was very excited that he was coming on the show. And I thought that was a great combo. That was great chemistry. Oh, Andy, an Orthodox wedding is so beautiful. Yeah, I'm sure it is. You'll need a condoro. It's a sponsor. It's like a best man. Each of us gets to wear a, a crown of white flowers and, and the incense and the choir. In Travels with Andy, we find the classic argument about the wedding. What's it going to be like? How big is it? Whose expectations are revealed and uh, disappointed or met? You and I can get married real quick in Maryland. <laughs> oh, yeah. You're serious? I'd be nice and private, just the two of us. Like some sailor running off with a hooker? No, it doesn't have to be that. Andy, I don't think that you know how much getting married means to me. Listen, it means a lot to me, too, but uh, do we have to make some production out of it where we both wear flowers and... I don't think of it as an ordeal. And I don't want to take my vows in some marriage mill that smells like booze and cigarette smoke. That created some tension between Sylvia and, and he because uh, she was planning a big Greek thing, and uh, he just, he would prefer a real simpler just... And when he first, when he finds out that this is her plans and her intentions, of course, then, then he, you know, he becomes his crabby, grumpy self again. But we're very different. You know, uh, what she likes and what I like. We're getting married. That's great, Andy. Congratulations, man. Yeah, only, uh, she's mad at me now and I'm stuck up here. You know, I had my own big fat Greek wedding, so I know that there's a, it means a lot to, to the Greeks. The wedding is so sacred, so uh, I understand now why she fought for it. A big wedding. It's what every girl dreams of. And it had a very special meaning for me. No problem. That's what I want, to. I think your father's got the right idea. Something big here in the city. I mean, uh... How many chances am I going to get to wear a crown of flowers? <laughs> <laughs> so I guess it's serious with this Gregory. Yeah, it is. I guess I was hoping that, uh, you know, with the decks cleared, it's me and Judy. Maybe you'd be interested in seeing me again. I don't think so. This episode is called A Murder With Teeth In It. And my ex boyfriend who is a New York Ranger comes to town and he and Gregory Metavoy gets very jealous what are you doing Gregory I'm simply saying that you can understand my feelings oh I thought you meant to apologize that you said cruel things about someone you don't know and acted like a jerk Donna, this is a complicated situation. You're making it that way. That was when my relationship with Donna began to disintegrate. Um, she uh, gets her radar up about my jealousy, and uh, it just gets worse as the show goes on. It's really sad to watch. You were spying on me? No, not spying. Well, what do you call it, Gregory? You followed me. Well, I, I, I don't call it spying. What did you think? I was going to meet Harold for an afternoon quickie? This particular episode had some... Uh, great relationship uh, stories in them. Dealing with um, Bobby Simone and Benita's character starting to have their problems. I liked you so much, Bobby. Yeah, and you had your job to do. Oh, just like you have you. Good night. And then the other sad one, the one that, was real, that everybody was rooting for and pulling for, was... Um, uh, Donna Abandando 
and uh, Medivoy. I don't want to fight like this. Neither do I. Look, uh, give me two hours from the end of my tour. I'll, 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 I'll be packed and gone. You see, I thought we loved each other. Me too. That looks like that's having problems too, and that's a split up. And so you know, that that was a sad note. Uh, but then on the other hand, Martinez is starting to be attracted, and he's starting to express his attraction towards the Lesniak character. And I sort of revealed those uh, thoughts to my partner, Detective Metavoy, who was like, you know, you know, does she know about it? <laughs> I guess I guess you got to be a little more straightforward. Um, I'm gonna try that. Yeah, I'm gonna try that. Yeah. Otherwise, they misinterpret. Bombs Away is, is, if there's such a thing as an ordinary NYPD Blue episode uh, in the second season where some something wasn't going on off camera, that was it. And it was fun because we got to let the characters sort of beat themselves and... We had two wonderful guest stars in there, uh, Richard Schiff, who went on to uh, West Wing, and Deborah Messing, who's on Will and & Grace. And if you want to see a kind of meat and potatoes NYPD blue, in the best sense of the term, that's the episode. Richard Schiff played uh, uh, this uh, mad Romanian bomber, and uh, he was funny and yet deadly serious at times. Why did you have that woman in your trunk? You see a poor man on the street in winter, starving and no place to sleep. You do nothing, he dies. Is that crime? That was a strong episode, and uh, during that one, the, the, the finalization of Metavoy and Don Abandando's character, that's when we realized for sure they are breaking up. I made a mistake. Look, I need some time. Would you back off and give me that? All right, all right. Around Christmas time, uh, I was having a conversation with David Milch, and he went, oh, by the way, there's, uh, I guess I'd call a little bump in the road for you and uh, Abandando uh, coming up here. You know, just I, I thought I'd give you a heads up. And uh, I got the script uh, a couple of weeks later, and <laughs> I went, bump in the road? You know, this is like... Uh, you're breaking us up. What's going on here, you know? In Un-American Graffiti, we find something out about Sylvia that I believe really helped in, in, in giving her a little more complexity and uh, the relationship with Sipowitz um, another level of trust. Some guy snatched my purse up in 2-7. Sylvia, did it hurt you? No, I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I was just finished taking a statement there, and I was on my way to the subway, and he came up behind me, and he grabbed my purse strap off my shoulder and just yeah. took off. We come to find out later, through a painful uh, confession she makes to Andy, that she had been raped in college. So a lot of that post-traumatic stress from the rape uh, shows up again that evening. I got raped. Oh, yeah. So, this brought a lot of that back. Yeah. They catch a guy? I didn't report it right away. I... I had a lot of trouble with it. Emotionally, really a wrenching uh, uh, part of that, that story that was being told in that episode for both Andy and for Sylvia. It was, it was good drama. She had never confided um, in anyone about this because, like so many rape victims, it makes her feel dirty and uh, damaged and was afraid that it might change the way Andy sees her, touches her, feels about her. I was afraid that you would think of me differently. I think you're beautiful, and I love you. That gives us a lot of faith as to how these two people will be able to care for each other. It's not just Sylvia holding Andy's hand, being the stalwart, steadying 
force for him, but he could do the same for her. So in the episode 30 Socks was when Martinez sort of uh, came up with the idea that maybe he'd like to box, that he'd like to maybe, you know, sign up for the PAL, the Police Athletic Club League, and because they have their own fights. A lot of cops, they have their own club fights with firemen or cops versus cops. Yeah, I box a little Golden Gloves. Is that right? Yeah. You can enter? Nah, I don't need to borrow trouble. We ought to work out some, you know, spar a little bit. And it sort of came out of my my own exuberance every day of shadow boxing on the set, and Bill Clark used to tell David Milch, and, you know, they, they always, you know, they used to call me, you know, I, I forget what they used to call me, Nikki T or Nikki Boom Boom. Dennis had named me a few names, but I was always throwing punches. I'm gonna get those gloves back on you. Yeah, all right. Good night, Bob. Hey, James. <laughs> a good portion of the episode deals with the shooting of a candy shop owner. And it turns out that uh, this is where Andy used to work as a young boy. I'm sorry for your loss, Mom. What did I tell you when you were a boy, Andy? If someone came in with a gun. Empty the register. If they can carry the register out on the back, that's fine, too. When I would leave you working in the store, didn't I tell you that? I guess Sonia wouldn't give it to him. She wouldn't give him the money. Andy was personally invested in this story because it meant so much to him from his past and the circumstances being of how she was killed um, was a real setback for him because it was somebody he knew from the past. She was not supposed to be there. She... <laughs> I don't know why Sox had a loaded gun. He said it was to back people off and he slipped when she swung the bat. Well, that is not good enough, okay? That's no excuse. There was not supposed to be violence. It offered an opportunity to get a glimpse of Andy when he was a young boy and uh, just just get a little sense of what his life might have been like as a, as a little guy. I gotta go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. You know, you're losing an hour of shifting to John. Innuendo, what a f great title, especially for this episode, because not only has it got a double entendre, but poor Andy is faced with something that only David Milch would be able to put in an episode and make endearing and funny and meaningful. Um, he has an enlarged prostate. Now, you know, how many people want to deal with that on a, a show that's, you know, hot and sexy and hip? Bear down. Oh, boy. Try not to pull away. It just takes me longer. <gasps> what are you, pitching a tent up there? Just another second. But somehow, Sip with his character, um, benefits from having an enlarged prostate, at, at least in the eyes of the audience, because we feel for him. So what did this doctor say? Inflamed prostrate. Can I help that? Took my mind off it a minute with that exam. One of the most common mispronunciations of a word is prostrate. And uh, uh, David Milch, being as clever as he is, uh, realized that, that Andy, of course, would not pronounce prostate correctly. And John Irvin overhears this conversation all the time, and he, he tries to correct me on, he says, I, I believe it's prostate. And I say, no, it's prostrate. Have I been mispronouncing that word all these years? I always thought it was prostate. No, it's prostrate. And then he goes so far as to, he leaves an open dictionary with the, the spelling and uh, the, the correct pronunciation of the word on my desk. And I <laughs> see this, and Still not willing to accept it. Slam the book. What a smart ass. Throw the book away, you know. This way, if I'm ever on that quiz show Jeopardy, and they ask about prostrate, some other idiot's going to say the gland behind the nuts, and I'm going to say, no, 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 no. That means to lie face down in a posture of submission. My old friend, PAA Urban, told me that. I used to know which word to use in which situation before the show began. But every time I have to say prostrate or prostate now, I have to go back through the whole innuendo storyline to figure out which is the right word to say in which situation. These notebooks, I can get them back at some point. I want them back. Of course I want them back. Wait a minute, I gotta use a can in here. I can't stop going. Hey, you're making up for lost time. In that particular episode, uh, Andy's life is in danger. And Bobby Simone indeed comes to the rescue. To me for four months rent. Uh, that 
further endeared him to me and in our relationship to Sylvia, that ultimately leads to one of the reasons why I ask him to be my best man. Ask sign off on a shooting? Yeah. Because uh, I'm prepared to nominate it among my all-time favorites. <sighs> all right, I'm going to get some lunch. Uh, you want something? No, I'm good. Thanks. Anytime, partner. Bobby Simone, and we working back up with you. Diane Russell. Good to meet you, Diane. Mm -hmm. One of television's steamiest love relationships that we've ever experienced, I think, not only on our show, but I think possibly on television, um, was introduced in this particular episode, and that's when uh, Kim Delaney's character, uh, Diane Russell, comes into our station house for the first time. And there's an immediate attraction between Bobby Simone and her. Taking off? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I'm gonna take off as soon as I finish here. Well, if you can wait 10 minutes, maybe we can grab some dinner together. Sure. I got 10 minutes. Great. We had some problems of finding a, or somebody with real chemistry with Jimmy Smits. Uh, don't ask me why, because I felt myself attracted to him. But uh, he, it just was something we couldn't find. And with Diane Russell or Kim Delaney, it was there immediately. This episode was my introduction onto the show. And I came on as an undercover cop. I'm just supposed to be there for a short time to work on this one particular case. She came in really for a story arc. You know, I think we had a three or four episode story arc and we needed a, a, a female detective. Kim was so startling on the screen and you could instantly see chemistry, not only with Jimmy, but just chemistry, you know? She just resonated within the environment of, of, of NYPD Blue. And so David and I very quickly saw a character emerge that we wanted to write for. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. I'm not ahead of myself. I don't like turning innocent people into criminals. How many model citizens you know can get their hands on half an ounce of cocaine in 20 minutes? If Cangelosi cooperates, fine. But if he doesn't give the other guy up, I'm not going to testify against him at a trial. It was really fun to play that character because she had this really strong side that was the cop side and the and the persona she put out there for her work. And then there was this very hurt, vulnerable side that had been damaged years ago. That was the episode where uh, me and, and Lieutenant Fancy decided to, uh, to get it on and, and have a, a little sparring match in the ring. You all right, Lou? Fine, let's go. You sure? I said, I'm fine, let's go. I, I never boxed, you know? But he wanted to box, and he had to find somebody to box with. So I was going to box with him. OK, fine. I'm this ex-Golden Glove boxer, and I got this mental problem with boxing, OK? But you know, we're two different weight classes and two different sizes. But being that I had fooled around and sparred and played in the ring, I, I was kind of like a little more relaxed. And, and James was a little, you know, a little too into it, you know? And he was like, uh, pss, pss. he kept like popping me in the head. And there was one shot that I was supposed to throw and miss him. And he kept sticking his chin out as if, OK, this is where the shot comes. And he kept sticking his chin out and say, stop doing it. But he kept doing it. And finally, they said, go for it. Just swing. We need it to look real, Jim. So I swung where I was supposed to swing, and his chin was in the way. <laughs> Instead of like, you know, he could have hit me, but it didn't have to be so hard. I had a headache for two days. I was like, that McDaniel, I'm going to get him. In this episode, I do realize because Andy is um, very aware of his alcohol problems and uh, he is becoming suspicious of uh, Diane Russell possibly having a drinking problem because he... He thinks he smells some liquor on her, and uh, uh, so he's starting to look at her with uh, suspicion. Sipowitz smells something familiar because he's been through that whole cycle. Simone doesn't know anything about that yet. You know what? Um, I've got to go pick something up. What, it just occurred to you? Yeah, it just occurred to me. But you want me to plan for lost time? Us? Hmm. I'll see you up in the square. Okay. In Simone's case, a cop like that may be shut down emotionally for years and years and years, particularly if he lost the woman that he loved, you know. But if he sees a wounded bird, he
he's going to take care of her. Even if he's not functioning yet emotionally, his training teaches him to take care. So uh, I, now I had no articulate sense of any of that, but I kind of knew that whoever he was drawn to was going to be a drunk. Uh, just a second. Again, I had no understanding at that time of why she was drinking, although I came to find out you know, what her emotional background was, but that's a story for another season. The Bank Dick was an episode where John Irvin, the PAA in the precinct, asked Simone to intervene in a situation where Irvin's gay lover, who is a cop, had been harassed by another cop. And Simone goes to the harassing cop and tells him to stop it. What, are you going to collar us? Off what? Who's your witnesses? Who's going to sign a complaint? You better understand me here. I know you did this. Anything more happens to this cop Caputo or his friend, I'm going to come looking for you. OK. Diane's drinking problem, uh, she's in denial, of course, and will not admit uh, nor acknowledge that she does have one, and certainly not confess it to anybody else. And Bobby Simone confronts her on it, and of course, uh, she denies it. So Andy said he thought you might have been drinking last night when you showed up at the hospital. I had wine with my dinner. He's concerned that you might have a problem. Didn't Andy used to drink? Yeah. Now he's in a program. Mm -hmm. AA people think everybody's a drunk. Also in this episode, Sipowitz asks Simone to be his best man. I was hoping maybe you'd stand up at my wedding, be my best man. If you'd be comfortable with that. I'd be glad to, Andy. You wouldn't mind being the only person that half of the church? <laughs> There's also another relationship that comes together, and, and that's of uh, Metavoy uh, is going to try to find, once again, happiness with his ex-wife. And so they're going to reunite. Greg, maybe we should try again for everyone's sakes. I don't think so, Marie. The girls miss you. And they need you. And I need you, too. When Metavoy comes back and tells Donna that, you know, he's going to go back to his wife for the kids, I loved that the writers let Donna be an adult, let her have, even though she was sad and had the emotions, she still maintained dignity. I should probably uh, think of the kids. Well, it's really getting on spring, huh? My phone's ringing, Greg. Yeah. The final episode of the second season was called ADA Sipowitz, and, and the high point of that episode was the, was the marriage of uh, Sipowitz and Costas, which obviously culminated their, uh, their romance. This episode uh, has m many interesting factors. Uh, Nick Turturro loves to sing. Um, he loves to sing at weddings. In this episode, the bachelor party, James Martinez, Nick Turturro's character, begins singing to me. And now the end is near, and so I face the final curtain. Not too different from the manner that Nick Turturro likes to sing, in fact did sing, at my wedding, which took place, I believe, one month or two months to the date prior to us filming uh, the Andy Sylvia wedding. So that was very much on my mind, was my wedding. you all said, oh yeah. <clears throat> There's the finish line. <sighs> Tell you the truth, I didn't know if I was going to make it. I can imagine that viewers were probably wondering throughout that whole last sort of run of the four or five episodes leading up to it, would he make it to the altar? I could still be on the turnpike before anybody knew I was missing. You don't want that. No. I just don't want to screw up. But what you really find is that this is something that he's looking forward to, not dreading. That he may have doubts and fears about his success in it, but he, uh, he, he wants this. He loves uh, Sylvia, and she does him, and she's willing to take the risks then and uh, 
recognize that this is a good man, even with all the difficulties they've had. Look at that beautiful girl. And you see Andy and Bobby Simone together, which is so lovely. Andy and his best man, Bobby Simone, and they look great in their tuxedos. You never see that in the show, these two guys dressed to the nines like that. And you can tell that Bobby is the rock that's holding Andy steady at that time. It's a beautiful thing to see. When Sylvia is walking down the aisle, that was very, very easy for me to relate to. Um, I saw my wife, Joni, coming down the aisle in my eyes. And uh, uh, so it was very, it was very moving for me to, to relive that experience. I remember Sylvia, uh, uh, Sharon Lawrence, walking down the aisle and Dennis with that sort of uh, peaceful, uh, beautiful smile uh, of a guy who's really uh, comfortable with what, uh, uh, with the decision he's making and the step he's taking in his life. It just was, it was, it was, and the music was great. It was just, it really made you feel uh, that they were getting married. The show ends with a look on Andy's face that really sums up a joy that, that we've never seen in his eyes before and um, a satisfaction and a sense of hope. And it's a beautiful way to end season two. What was evident by the end of the year was how amazingly sound the structure of this show was in terms of its writing and in terms of these wonderful actors. We'd weather our, you know, controversies about language and nudity, and people had really come to realize, you know, what the show was. That summer, we got a ton of Emmy nominations for the second year in a row. And so I think we were all sort of looking forward to that, you know, in hopes that we might win it, and we did. That was the year we won. And so, you know, our expectations going into the third year of, of NYPD Blue was full steam ahead. Life doesn't let you set the schedule for your art particularly, and if you're lucky enough, you, you, you find a way to, to include the art. And, and uh, I hope over the course of the uh, season that's what we did.